Hello, Jim Holt? Yes. How are you? Uh, not too bad. I'm having a wicked bad hair day, but otherwise uh, reasonably well. How are you? Well, that just adds to the uh, Blogging Heads um, garage band ambiance, the, yes, uh, the yes. bad hair and the bad lighting and <laughs> bad audio and all that stuff. So, uh, Jim, I think the, uh, the last and only time that I've met you was... Um, in 1996, when you came to a uh, a, a little lunch for uh, the launch of my first book, The End of Science, it wasn't a little lunch. It was an extremely extravagant and sumptuous lunch oh. at the at the Gramercy Tavern. And I remember that I reviewed your book in the Wall Street Journal, and I thought it's not a very good book, but his publisher gave me such a good lunch, and I gave it a rave review. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, you're being a little bit too candid here, Jim. Um, <laughs> I, kid, I, I kid John. It was a great book, and I, and I gave it a, a well-deserved uh, rave review. Uh, thanks. Uh, I actually was fishing for compliments. Um, so, Jim, uh, I know you've been on Blogging Heads once before, but I wonder if you could tell um, our viewers, and I'm curious, too, a little bit about your uh, background. I've been seeing your pieces, apart from uh, your reviews of... Uh, my own work, um, appearing in various places for quite a while now. I wonder if you can uh, tell us how you got into journalism and uh, what your training was and uh, what your interests are and so forth. Well, I, I came to uh, New York uh, in the, um, uh, at the end of the 1970s to study philosophy and mathematics at Columbia and to go, oh. to, Studio, and to, go to Studio 54 mainly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, after a few years, I sort of declined into uh, journalism. But I did have credentials in mathematics and philosophy and economics. So I did a, a master's degree in in philosophy, and I'm a DB. I mean, an, a, an ABD in various things. And so uh, I have a, enough of a technical background that I can I can fake it as a journalist. Uh, and so ever since then, I've been writing about. Uh, Mathematical topics, uh, cosmological topics, philosophical topics, a uh, little bit about ethics and public policy. Um, and I've uh, spent uh, a semester as a journalist in residence at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute out in uh, Berkeley. Very interesting, living, actually living among the tribe of mathematicians, a very strange yeah. uh, set of people. They, they are all, of course, as you probably know, they're all obsessed with uh, mu the only thing they care about other than mathematics is music. <laughs> and so immediately they say, you know, what instrument do you play? And I'm not a real mathematician, so I, I said I play the hecklephone. Uh, they left me the alone. What? The hecklephone. <laughs> you want to know uh, what the okay. heck a hecklephone okay, is? Okay, I'll bite. What is the hecklephone, Jim? Well, well, it was invented by. Uh, we're really off topic here, but it's an interesting topic. It was invented by uh, uh, Adolf Heckel in the 19th century, around the same time. I'm sorry, August Heckel, around the same time that Adolf Sax invented the saxophone. The saxophone, as you know, took off. The hecklephone didn't really go anywhere, but it's a marvelous, charming instrument, and I hope someday a composer writes a concerto for the hecklephone. Yeah, it's um, a very evocative name. Um, yeah. So you were somebody who contemplated being a serious scholar and then uh, became a total dilettante like the rest of us. Precisely, precisely. And I'm still doing penance for my failure to, uh, to uh, uh, do a Ph.D., Every year, I work through a difficult uh, text in uh, higher mathematics, um, and this year I'm, I'm working through um, uh, some Galois theory texts. And the older I get, the more I realize that I realize that those faculties are simply shutting down. Uh, oh my God! You, so you actually you were studying real math, not just sort of philosophy. Oh, indeed, I was. Indeed, I, 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 became, I developed that math, math, mathematician's neurosis when I, I would become so absorbed in a uh, trying to prove a, th a theorem in algebraic topology that I, for, you know, for, for days at a time I would walk around muttering to myself and making weird gestures because everything in the empirical world, that, uh, the, that shabby world that you, John, live in, seemed so uninteresting to me because I was dwelling in the platonic world of pure mathematical entities and ideas. And uh, suddenly I realized that my, my friends were sort of drifting away from me, and I was b becoming more and more eccentric in a slightly unpleasant way. And that's well, when that's I realized... Ha that, happened, that happens to me all the time, but it has nothing to do with mathematics. <laughs> hey, listen, no, no. Jim, I, 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 want to, um, I want to get back to uh, mathematics. I've actually spent some time at um, uh, what I, I think is called Misery, the Mathematical Sciences 
Institute for what? What's it? What's Mathe- the... Mathematical. Re- uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, MSRI, Mathematical Sciences Research Institute. Yeah, it's up, I spent up a little the hills time. behind uh, behind Berkeley, and it's uh, there are about fifty or sixty uh, mathematicians there from all over the world at any given time, and it's the closest you'll get to Platonic heaven on this uh, on this earth. Yeah, I've I've been out there myself. I did a big article on mathematics for Scientific American in the early 90s and spent some time with Bill Thurston and some other people out there. Ah. So I want to get back to that. But first of all, I've got to ask you about um, this book that you've been working on for a while. So uh, in your tagline, identifying you at the bottom of articles that you write for the last few years, there's been a reference to you working on a book on the puzzle of existence. So that's intriguing, and uh, I was hoping that you could, um, first of all, tell us when this is going to be finished, and then tell us what it's about. Um, it's uh, going to be finished at the end of the year. I've just written the prequel to it, which is coming out in July, uh, which is called Stop Me If You've Heard This, A History and Philosophy of Jokes. Uh, and I, I thought that uh, there's a certain amount of, um, of uh, humor involved in the puzzle of existence. I mean, it's a slightly comic puzzle. The, the idea of, the, of this book and the puzzle of existence is to see how far we can go in answering the question that uh, the philosopher Leibniz posed in the, uh, in the 17th century. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why does a universe, why does a world exist? Not this world, but why should there be any world at all? Wouldn't it be simpler and more natural if nothing at all existed? Now, some people think this is a rather silly question that you know it might occur to uh, to uh, uh, undergraduates uh, having a you know a late night rap session or or to a uh, an investment banker having a dark night of the soul. You know why why should anything exist at all? Uh, to some philosophers, it seemed the most you know, profound and aw- awesome question uh, that could be posed. Wittgenstein was one of these, and Martin Heidegger, the, uh, the, the, the Nazi phenomenologist, said this is the, you know, it, it's a question so deep it, it, it tears the mind asunder. And so I thought, you know, uh, what progress have we made in explaining why there's a world at all um, since Leibniz posed the question? And in fact, uh, a number of uh, a number of scientists, a number of physicists, have been grappling with this and trying to explain how the world could have popped into existence out of nothing at the time of the Big Bang. Uh, philosophers continue to discuss it. Uh, theologians uh, have their own ideas, and I thought it would be fun to go around and talk to. I've actually, I very much imitated your methodology, John, when you wrote the the end of science. I went around and talked to the greatest thinkers on the subject and try to get them to think out loud. And when you get you know, great thinkers to think out loud, as you're so good at doing, they often say, you know, completely unexpected and slightly wacky things. And you realize, you know, they maybe don't know all that much more than I know. Uh, well, listen, you, I've, got to, I've got to ask you something. So um, I, uh, you might think watching uh, George Johnson, my uh, usual partner, uh, and me do these things, um, that uh, we don't prepare at all. But actually, I, uh, I do prep for these uh, conversations, and this morning I was, show. I was Googling your name and uh, found an essay you wrote for Harper's in 1994 on this very puzzle over uh, why existence should, should be here at all. So I just wonder, and it, was, it seemed to be kind of a, a, um, a thumbnail version of what you just described. You sort of go around and and uh, talk to different people and ponder different ideas about uh, different possible answers to this question, why there's something rather than nothing. I just wonder how your thinking has evolved, or even your, your methodology, the, the answers that you take seriously, how those have evolved um, over the last uh, almost 15 years now. Uh, I now think that there are two plausible answers to the the, the, the ultimate cosmic question, why is there something rather than nothing? One of them comes out of contemporary cosmology. And um, I, uh, uh, you may have heard of a man called um, Andre Vilenkin, who teaches yes. at, at Tufts, I believe. Yes. A- and he, uh, he, first of all, came up with a very neat definition of nothingness. You know, some people, uh, uh, the philosopher uh, Henri Bergson, for example, said, the whole concept of nothing is incoherent. We can't imagine pure nothingness. 
And Andrei Vilenkin said, well, let's see how well we can do just using concepts from physics. Uh, I'll define nothing as a closed four-dimensional space-time of zero radius. Not bad. Uh, <laughs> how do you like that? Uh, Not a bad start. Uh, you know, I guess it'll do for a start. Okay, and then he, and then he uh, used uh, the equations of quantum cosmology and uh, derived a, uh, a positive probability for a little patch of uh, false vacuum uh, tunneling into existence by, you know, by quantum processes out of the state of nothingness. And once you, as you know, once you have a small patch of uh, false vacuum, that's enough to get an entire universe underway uh, via the uh, inflationary theory uh, uh, that's um, uh, of, um, of um, I'm drawing like Andre Linda. Oh, uh, yeah, and Guth, and yeah, and, bunch and of Guth, other yes, people. exactly, yeah. So um, I thought, you know, this is probably as, as good as uh, uh, as has ever been done in answering this primordial existential question: Why is there something rather than nothing? Is that even remotely satisfying to you? The the uh, the answer well, of Vilenkin? I mean, because it because of course it um, it leaves unanswered the question of where the uh, these uh, laws of physics came for that allows this sort of quantum fluctuation fluctuation in the first place. So it just sort of uh, yeah. pushes the answer to the question uh, back one level, which is uh, what yes. that, which is what all <laughs> these sorts of answers uh, have always done, and well, which, it, that's it what makes on... them so unsatisfying. Right. Um, you know, ultimately there are limits to, to the to the logic of explanation, and it seems to me that. You know, first we, we start by coming up with a theory that explains the world around us, and the best theory we have is based on quantum mechanics. Now, let's see if we can do more with that theory. Let's see if we can not only explain the evolution of the universe and the phenomena in the world that we see around us, but let's see if we can explain how the universe popped into being. So, yes, we're, we're taking laws that we've discovered that explain the empirical world around us, and we're asking something more of them. Can they explain the the, the coming into existence of that world? And yeah. and by, you know, by golly, they, they do. And it seems to me that you know that's the most you can hope for. Any explanation has to start with something. And if you're answering the question, why is there something rather than nothing? There's always the danger that you're going to uh, that that the something you use to explain the uh, to answer this question is part of the something that you're trying to explain. So, now, did yes, you, I mean, it's not utterly... I, you know, I, by the way, I'd like to get into to this notion of scientific laws. I know that you've discussed this uh, in the past uh, recently, the uh, op-ed piece by uh, Paul Davies in the New York Times uh, several months ago, where he, uh, in a sense, chastised the world of science for its uh, theological reliance on the idea of a natural law. And, and he felt that this, this was deeply anti-rational. Um, yeah, I... I, I, yeah, I, I, I um, reacted disparagingly to that, but first let me just ask you: uh, In your book, do you you know you've been talking about explanations coming from the world of science and more specifically physics? Do you get into? I mean, this is the realm traditionally of uh, theology. So, do you uh, do you contemplate theological explanations or even philosophical explanations in your book as well? Oh, very much so. Um, the the obviously the theological explanation is, although we live in a contingent world that might not have existed, you know the proof of that is is the fact that the world is finite, that it came into existence 14 billion years ago, roughly, with the Big Bang. Um, it has to be based on some uh, uh, an entity that exists by its own nature. And this is the traditional idea of God. You know, you recall the, the famous um, ontological proof of uh, St. Anselm from the uh, 11th century, I think, mm-hmm. where, where you know, the, the, the existence is built into, the necessary existence is built into the very essence of God. Uh, and so this is an idea that, you know, it's, it's almost a thousand years old, uh, and it's been revived uh, in, in recent uh, decades by... Uh, uh, practitioners of something called modal logic. I know you, I'm know i sure you know about modal logic. It's the logic of necessity and possibility. And there was a, a uh-huh. great philosopher named Saul Kripke. Uh, Saul Kripke, I think, was the last philosopher who appeared on the cover of the New York Times magazine. This was back in 1976. And Saul Kripke created a semantics for modal logic that enabled uh, 
that that enable us to make sense of of uh, sentences that is that of the form it is necessary that it is possible that it is necessary that p that sort of thing. So it's a very t- you know technical mathematical discipline, modal logic. But other philosophers said, you know, this is precisely what will give us a new way, a way of breathing new life into the ontological argument for the existence of God. Well, um, Jim, Jim, let me just... Let we don't want to get into this too you, deeply. It's, let, me just, let me just ask you personally. See, one, one of the things that I find interesting about your writing is that um, you always are very coy about where you stand. And I, I feel like you kind of... Um, uh, make fun of people who uh, are standing in a particular place or take a very strong view. For example, you um, reviewed Richard uh, Dawkins's book, The God Delusion, and were pretty critical of him for not taking uh, theology seriously enough. So I was hoping I could pin you down today on what your views are. So in most of your writings, you kind of entertain ideas or entertain theories or answers, but you never commit yourself to any. And I'm just wondering after this, uh, you know, you've, you've just finished this book or you're, you will be finished very soon, and where do you come out? For example, let's just start with God. Do you in any way, shape, or form believe in God or a creator or, you know, whatever? Uh, I would not... Uh... I would not uh, rule out the possibility, say that the that the universe we live in has a an intelligent cause, and the I think the new metaphor that makes that a reasonable thing to suppose is uh, computer simulations. If you look at the relationship between when when a, when a, uh, uh, a c- computer scientist writes code for to you know to, uh, to create a simulation of a world in which little uh, entities with, that might consist of a number of you know, contiguous cells begin to evolve and get more complicated and, and suddenly within the computer simulation they start looking like living things in a way. And you can imagine a more complicated computer simulation in which these evol- evolving things actually uh, develop something like minds and something like consciousness. And you know, this raises the question could we be living in a computer simulation? And now, if, if, if you believe that there's an infinite universe, uh, and if you believe that there are many uh, uh, intelligent uh, civilizations in this universe, if they're like our civilization, they're probably, they've probably invented something like the computer. And if they're like, they're like our civilization, they're probably running loads of simulations and creating what, what are you know, uh, sim worlds, uh, mm-hmm. artificial worlds. And so... I, I, I know you've, you've heard this argument. If you uh, accept those premises, it's probable that there are far more simulated worlds than actual worlds. So it's very possible that our world is a, is a simulation uh, that is you know being run by some sort of uh, you know a, you know from our perspective godlike hacker in another universe and. Um, if you did you? Think I, I just have to. Inter- I just have to interrupt you. Did you see the? Uh, well, I know you did see because we uh, emailed about it. The article by Dennis Overby last Tuesday in the Science Times on um, uh, Boltzmann brains on the possibility that, or even the likelihood that uh, this universe or my experience of it isn't actually a uh, an entire universe. It is just. Um, a, a fragment of of a uh, universe, and I ha- that uh, Im- that somehow uh, embodies my imagination of an entire universe. It's an idea that's very similar to the one you just described. It's it's basically saying that the chances are much more likely that instead of this is this being a whole physical universe containing lots of beings like us, it's probably just a simulation of one. Or uh, an imagined uh, universe, right? Right. And I, well, I have it, to say, I have to say, Jim, this kind of thing—it's what drew me into science in the first place, uh, 25 years ago. Um, I love this sort of uh, almost uh, theological speculation coming from science, but it's now I've begun to think that there's something almost immoral about it because it's it's undercutting the reality of this world. 
it's um, it, it, it's sort of adolescence is act- asking us to to actually take seriously the possibility that this this is all unreal some somehow. And it seems to me that that leads to a kind of um, it means that you don't take seriously some of the very real issues that we're trying to grapple with in the world today. Mm. Um, I just wonder if that's if that's uh, a reaction that you can relate to anyway, or if, or in any way, or if you actually uh, really uh, do take these sorts of speculations seriously. No, I think the the reality of the world should be undercut. I, I think you know, one of the problems <laughs> I have with the with, with the neo atheists is that they tend to rely on a, a, a sort of a 19th century uh, materialist worldview. Uh, their that that's their their metaphysical foundation, and they haven't really uh, taken cognizance of, uh, of, of t- discoveries in the 20th century, the, the uh, inexplicability of the Big Bang, the, uh, uh, the quantum theory, which seems to suggest that the universe is more like a thought than it is like a, like a machine. Uh, when, you, when you penetrate down to the, you know, back to the beginning of time and down to the very sort of smallest levels of reality, Everything gets ghostly and mathematical and looks more like ideas than like stuff. Uh, and so I, I, I agree with you. I mean, this you would call all of this ironic science because much of it can't. Um, you know, it, it's purely speculative. There are no there are no ways of testing it empirically so far. Although it, I mean, in, in fairness, the uh, theory of inflation, which uh, gives rise to all kinds of wild cosmological ideas, has been uh, a pretty uh, Successful in predicting the background, the, the contours of the background radiation picked up by the the COBE uh, satellite and so forth. Um, so it's not all based on wild lotus eating speculation. But well, then I, you know, I, there was uh, there was just a little piece by Paul Steinhardt uh, on uh, John Brockman's site, The Edge, which we talk about pretty often uh, on this show. And uh, Steinhardt, unless I misunderstood him, uh, says in this little piece that um, he's moved beyond inflation. He thinks that it's, uh, it's almost uh, too flexible in being able to explain various uh, cosmological uh, phenomena. There have been no Nobel Prizes awarded for inflation, even though it's been around for almost 30 years, uh, in part, I think, because it, comes, it comes in, it's sort of like string theory. It comes in so many different versions that it's almost impossible, or it is impossible, to um, to falsify it. So, uh, and this is this is probably the major candidate for explaining why there's something rather than nothing, or certainly a major candidate. For, yeah, for explaining it scientifically. The I wouldn't say that uh, inflation can't be falsified because the original version of inflation that Alan Guth came up with, you know, pretty much was falsified, and it was superseded by uh, Andre Linda's uh, uh, chaotic inflation. Uh, I don't. I, I have no expertise in this area at all. Um, all I know is that the, you know, as I said, the the uh, inflation, the predictions made by uh, in, um, chaotic inflation uh, as to the exact sort of shape of the uh, background radiation have have uh, were been vindicated. But I also know that uh, among physicists, uh, particularly in this very speculative area, there's an amazing amount of of almost incredulous disagreement among the very. You know, top minds in physics. I was interviewing um, uh, Steven Weinberg uh, mm-hmm. a few uh, months ago, and uh, as you know, he's you know pretty much the father of the standard model of physics. Won the Nobel Prize back in the '70s for um, his role in unifying the um, the the weak force with the le- electromagnetic force. Mm-hmm. And I was talking with him about some ideas of um, Leonard Susskind, who's a uh, a string theorist out at Stanford, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the idea that there are ten to the five hundred uh, solutions to string theory, therefore there must be 10 to the 500 different universes, all of which are real. Yeah, what uh, did Weinberg say about that? Well, well the, the funny thing, what, what, you know, this is called the landscape, this sort of un- incredible, you know, 10 to the 500 is one followed by 500 zeros, that many different universes, of which ours is just one. And Susskind also believes that the, these, this manifold of universes corresponds to the many worlds uh, interpretation of quantum theory that it and I, 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 I we're getting into into very hairy stuff here but I mentioned that to Weinberg he said I just can't see what Susskind could be talking about here uh, and 
and you know this is where you see you know you see this a lot among philosophers where you know all of the leading philosophers on consciousness think of one another as being crazy you know my solution is obviously obviously correct and everyone else is just nuts and you know there's a right. little bit of this among physicists especially when we get into these very speculative uh, of areas um, and so and, you know, and, and the problem is is that they uh, the disputes can't be experimentally resolved and uh, that puts this all in the category of philosophy or even theology it's not even science anymore that's, uh, that's another thing that bothers me about this yeah but it, I mean it is it's still possible that some uh, miraculous advance in, uh, mir- advance in string theory would result in a unique uh, uh, set of equations that uh, in fact uh, predict the world around us and you know, have all the mathematical symmetry and uh, elegance and uniqueness that we want. In that case, even though that theory would, 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 not, would not be subject to empirical verification right now, its sheer uh, mathematical beauty and its ability to predict the world around us would probably win an acceptance in the same way that Einstein's general theory, theory of relativity won acceptance long before it perceived decisive empirical verification. But that um, will I mean, not... that may not happen. Um, that probably won't happen because string theory now, as you know, it's been around for 30 years, and the the you know the the, the great theory that will um, uh, that, that you know the holy grail always seems to be just over the horizon. And usually in science, if 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 things aren't resolved relatively quickly, they never get resolved. And there's I don't think there's been any case of a of a theory that was proposed and outlined that you know didn't lead to a uh, a, a precise theory that could be tested within a, you know a decade or so. So I, I you know I would guess string theory is never going to come to anything just because if it w- had the potential to come to something, it w- already would have come to something. Well, that's interesting. I wonder if I hope that um, some uh, historians of science would uh, would um, uh, corroborate you or challenge you on that point that uh, that viable theories are um, established very quickly. That's that's uh, that's interesting. I can't think of any uh, uh, counterexamples. Let me just let me just offer my own uh, quantum theory took brief, about about two decades. Brief I mean, the, idea. Pardon me. Uh, quantum theory took about two decades actually. I mean the the quantum phenomena were discovered around 1900. Uh, 1905 was, uh, you know, Einstein and the photoelectric effect, which established the reality of the quantum. And the the final, uh, the the uh, you know Schrödinger's equation and and wave mechanics and uh, weren't uh, discovered until I guess 1925 or 27. So that took mm-hmm. that took two decades. So you know the, maybe yeah. that lends some hope to string theory. Um, all right. So you said before you wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the um, evolution of laws. I guess I, I think we've probably already gotten into this a bit. The uh, interesting point about that Davies essay that you cited before uh, that he raised was that um, the possibility of instead of laws being immutable, that they might actually uh, evolve over time. I know that John Barrow, the uh, British physicist among others, is also talked about the possibility that constants of nature evolved over time, and particularly in the very early universe, as well as the basic uh, laws of uh, nature. The problem I have with this is that, um, first of all, uh, the assumption that the laws are invariant through time and space has been a very powerful uh, and uh, overwhelmingly uh, Cons- uh, confirmed assumption. I mean, it's really been borne out to the extent that we can test it. Um, if we sort of throw away that assumption, it means that um, that uh, our theories can become even more flexible for explaining, for example, events in the very uh, early universe or the structure of the cosmic microwave background or the uh, uh, formation of galaxies very early in the universe. So it means that physics loses even more rigor than it already has, and I think then we're going to be uh, even more into the realm of ironic science. That's what Yeah, well, actually, it loses uh, precisely what you would throw out. If, if you assume uh, the, the, well, the, the, the invariance of physical laws 
the, the temporal and spatial invariance, the fact that the same laws apply now and the future and the past and also here in an Alpha and Centauri and everywhere else in the universe, that is, you know, technically that's a symmetry in the equations. And uh, there, you know, I, I don't know if you know about this beautiful result uh, back in the early 20th century, I think it was around 1918, of a, a woman mathematician named Emmy Noether, one of the, great, the greatest women mathematicians perhaps of the 20th century, proved a very beautiful thing. She proved that whenever you have an invariance or a symmetry in a, in a set of equations, there's a corresponding conservation principle. So the interesting thing about the invariance of laws uh, across time, the fact that the same equations are valid now, in the future, in the past, that corresponds logically to the principle of the conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. So if you throw out the invariance of laws, the, the, the time invariance of laws, in, in other words, if they're no longer temporally objective, you're also throwing out the conservation of energy. Now you might say, um, you know, how do we know that, uh, that energy is conserved? I mean, the first law of thermodynamics that says energy can, can neither be created nor destroyed it's not an axiom. It's, uh, it's something that uh, we've noticed empirically and that seems to hold up. But in mm -hmm. fact, whenever, whenever the law of conservation of energy seems to be violated, what do we do? We invent a new form of energy to keep it valid. And I remember mm -hmm. the uh, mathematician Henri Poincaré uh, said, we would sooner, you know, we'll always invent a new form of energy rather than give up conservation of energy. And what's interesting about that is that the you know, conservation of energy is logically equivalent to the laws of physics being the same in the past and the future as they are in the present. Um, and so, you know, maybe this is all based on our, you know, insistence that the, the con that, that con you know, our uh, that, that we retain the first law of thermodynamics and we'll always invent. We'll, if you know, we, we'll invent. Uh, first, there was mechanical energy, and then heat energy, and then gravitational energy, and then finally, we did, you know, Einstein decided that uh, even mass is frozen energy. Uh, so it could be it's sort of a reflection of our, you know, there, what is energy? Richard Feynman says we don't really know what energy is. It's a very abstract thing, and we have a certain amount of flexibility in defining what energy is. So maybe the the fact that that the laws of physics are the same across time is just a reflection of our own. You know, attachment to the idea of the conservation of energy. So, is that what you think? You think uh, that's going to turn out to be the case? I mean, you think it's going to be this uh, major shift in physics in the future that uh, the idea of these basic laws of physics being invariant is going to be uh, challenged and even discarded? No, I, I don't. I, I don't think that once you start discarding symmetries, if you discard, uh, you know, the, as I said, the conservation of energy is equivalent to the laws being the same in the past, present, and future conservation of momentum is equivalent to the laws being the same everywhere in space. Conservation of angular, angular momentum uh, means that if you do an experiment at one angle and you repeat the experiment in another orientation, you'll get the same result. So I don't see, I mean, the, 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 the enterprise of science uh, cannot exist without these, these sorts of symmetries because these symmetries together add up to the idea of objectivity. They mean that the results of science, the predictions of science, have to be the same regardless of your perspective. And to me, that seems you know, very much built into the, to the essence of science. And by the way, um, the, 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 back to the conservation of energy for just a second, um, the, the a cosmologist, uh, in, in many models, the, one of the, implica the, uh, the um, implications of the cosmological equations is that the net energy of the universe is zero. You've got all of this energy, you know, the energy of the stars and all of the energy uh, that's locked up in, ma in, in, in the mass of the universe. That's all positive energy. But that's balanced by all the negative um, potential energy of gravitation. And so in, in many models of the universe, especially when you have closed geometry, these two, uh, the uh, positive uh, kinetic energy and mass energy is exactly balanced by negative potential energy. So the total amount of energy is zero. And so if that's the case, it seems to me, you know, there's this kind of metaphysical argument for conservation of energy. There are always, there, there's, you know, the, the net energy is zero, always has been, always will be, because something can't be created from nothing. Now we're getting really metaphysical. So I don't know whether the, the invariance of physical laws, it may be a reflection of the fact that, you know, that, that we're... Um, 
that we invent new forms of energy to preserve the principle of conservation of energy, or maybe the conservation of energy is something that's built into the fabric of nature, because the net energy is always zero, and zero is a very nice number that doesn't require a lot of explanation. I feel uh, like there's there's uh, th this should be the point at which we segue into mathematics, because when you're talking about whether or not these laws are sort of out there uh, and are eternal and invariant and completely objective, independent of our perception of them, that's an idea that would be very familiar in the realm of, uh, of mathematics. Right. So, um, so I want. I will. We'll talk about mathematics only if you'll promise to give me a few moments to, at the end to talk about nuclear fusion. Oh, we could talk about real? fusion now since okay. we're talking about physics. No, sure. no, no. I mean, mathematics. I'm, I'm, I have a very uh, um, uh, cynical view of mathematics, uh, perhaps because I've been um, subjected to so much painful small talk from mathematicians. Um, but I, I, you know, Bertrand Russell, uh, when he was a young man. Uh, the, uh, made the famous uh, statement that uh, mathematics has a form of, of pure and austere beauty. It's uh, like the beauty of sculpture, and uh, he, he, you know, very much took a, a Platonic view of mathematics. But then, when he got old, he decided that mathematics is basically just a bunch of tautologies. That, to a mind of sufficient intelligence, all of mathematics would look like the tautology of four-legged animal is an animal. And I, and, and yet it and, works pretty. And yet it works pretty well. It allows us, for example, to have this um, this uh, telephone conversation. Uh, Some of it I mean, works you know, well. Uh, yeah, very. But, well, very but wait a minute. Let's okay. But before we start moving into mathematics, if you want to save that for later, I think we should talk about fusion because this will be one point at which our discussion actually intersects with real. Things, tangible stuff that you can uh, point to and uh, knock against. Indeed. So, um, why why is fusion important to you right now? Well, um, we have another enough fossil fuel to last a hundred years. So eventually, we're going to we're going to uh, suck all the, the oil and and uh, natural gas out of the earth and burn it. It'll end up in the atmosphere. Global warming will get worse and worse. The only serious alternative at the moment is uh, nuclear fission, fission reactors. Mm -hmm. uh, France generates about 82% of its uh, electricity with uh, nuclear fission. We generate about 20%. Uh, that's, of course, you know, that involves the fissioning of, the, uh, of uh, uranium. Um, how long can we survive on fission? Well, there's probably enough uranium in the world to last, you know, I, I've seen estimates 70 years, 100 years, something like that. So, it, you know, basically the same horizon as we get from fossil fuels. Oh, gee, I've never heard that, uh, I've never heard um, a uh, fission given, given that kind of uh, finite um, period because of the uh, limited fuel. I thought that there are ways of creating more and more fuel or recycling old fuel and uh, getting more uh, life out of that reactors. sounds like a little bit like a perpetual motion machine to me, though. Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, but the, well, okay. But, so tell me, tell me why. Danger, you yeah, I'm sorry. So, so what are the advantages of um, of fusion? The advantages of fusion. Well, for, first of all, let's suppose we uh, the, um, the problem with fission, in addition to the you know finite uh, amount of uranium and uh, fuel, is that you um, it can be weaponized. You have right. to worry, if you have a uranium enrichment uh, program in a country, you have to worry about the, the possibility of, of, uh, of uh, nuclear weapons being attained by that co country. Uh, you have ca catastrophes like Chernobyl, and also you have uh, terrible radioactive byproducts that have to be stored somewhere and don't and have a half-life of, you know, of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Fusion has, has none of those disadvantages. Fusion, by the way, just quickly, is, is when you take light nuclei, you know, a, a hydrogen isotopes, for example, and combine them into a heavier nucleus, like some version of helium. When you do that, uh, the, the net mass of the resulting uh, nucleus is a little bit less than the sum of the two parts, and the, the, the difference is converted to energy by our old friend E equals mc squared. That's, of course, the source of energy for the sun. The sun is basically a big... Uh, uh, you know, a plasma of uh, of, uh, of hydrogen atoms getting squeezed in together into helium atoms. Mm -hmm. um, now, and of the, course, it's also the source of uh, energy for hydrogen and uh, thermonuclear bombs. Uh, I, I'm sorry, say that again. 
And it's also the source of energy for hydrogen bombs. Yeah, new hydrogen bombs. Yeah, but the, pro- the the great thing about the uh, fusion reactor is now we don't ha- we don't have a working fusion reactor yet. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I'm going to go through its its uh, it, 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 three or four great virtues before we get to the practical problems. The w- one virtue is it can't be weaponized. The the overlap between the uh, uh, thermonuclear uh, energy and thermonuclear bombs is virtually zero, unlike the case with, uh, with fission with, uh, uh, bombs and fission reactors. Secondly, the byproducts, uh, the result of the reaction is helium. You know, you can, you can, you can uh, fill up uh, balloons for children's birthday parties with what you get out of a, uh, a fusion reactor. Uh, thirdly, you can have a runaway reaction. You can have a core meltdown with fusion because if it gets out of control, it stops. Uh, so it's, it's, it's got all of these advantages. And fourth, there's virtually an unlimited supply of deuterium in the world's oceans. There's enough that the, the figures I've seen, we have enough deuterium in the uh, ocean to beat the world's energy supplies for, get this, 150 billion years, which oh, is actually, about you know 30 times the lifespan of the sun. <laughs> Sounds great, right? Yeah. And, okay, once, so and it does no, no global warming effect. Uh, it, it, it's, its products are purely benign, don't add a global warming. In fact, with fusion energy, we could start scrubbing the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and reverse global warming. The problem is we can't control the reaction. And we've, you know, we've been trying uh, for 50 years now, roughly, to create a controlled fusion reaction. The problem is it, has, it requires so much pressure and so much heat that any sort of you know, material that we're familiar with to, 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 that would, could, might contain the reaction would simply vaporize under that heat. And so, you know, there, there's now in, in Europe, uh, in the uh, south of France, in Provence, a uh, consortium of countries, European countries, United States, China, Russia, India, and South Korea, are creating a new fusion reactor that um, uh, is based on a, a, a technology of magnetic containment of the fusion reaction. And if, if this works, if this reactor, you know, it, uh, can... It, it, now it takes more energy to contain the reaction than the reaction actually gives you in usable energy. But if we can um, arrive at a reactor that produces more energy than it consumes, and it will be self-sufficient, just imagine how you know, that would solve about nine-tenths of humanity's problems. I mean, right. just you know, I, you know, I let guess your the imagination run wild. The reason I'm uh, cynical about fusion is that um, I, uh, the first time I did a story about it, I was in journalism school in uh, 1982, so I was at Columbia, and we uh, all took a trip down to the uh, Princeton Fusion Lab, which was the premier fusion lab in the world at that time. They had this big magnetic confinement machine. It was just the coolest machine. It was. You walked into this room, and it was this gigantic structure with flashing lights and cables running all over it, and all. You know, it was exactly what you'd expect a gigantic scientific e- experiment to look like and uh, there are all these brilliant people there and uh, you know literally there are guys in white coats wandering around with clipboards uh, you know checking different instruments and so forth and they were telling us that um, within uh, 20 years we would have commercial fusion reactors that would basically uh, give us energy that was almost free it would be so cheap and so these sorts of promises sustained the uh, U.S. fusion program, um, you know, the civilian fusion program, because, of course, there's a uh, military program as well, over the next uh, 20 years. But then what happened is that the timeline for the fulfillment of the promise of fusion kept getting pushed back. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's like you know, string I think theory the, a bit. Yeah, exactly. So I think in the 50s, actually, they were talking about maybe 10 years. By the time I looked into fusion in the early 80s, it was 20 years. Now I think the most optimistic projections that you get from anybody are maybe uh, 50 years. Mm -hmm. I think this is a case of a technology that has turned out to be just um, too complex. Another reason why fusion research has been sustained in this country, and actually the budget for it has been drastically cut back. The, the Princeton Fusion Lab doesn't even exist anymore. There yeah. are Ditto for the really European de- project. By the, the United States, uh, in the 2008 science budget, they've essentially defunded the, uh, the, um, 
the, the, the fusion reactor in, uh, in France, um, and we've essentially pulled out of that consortium. Well, the only, the only for uh, the last time I looked into fusion, which was about 10 years ago, there were still some people pushing something called inertial confinement uh, confusion, which was being studied especially out at um, Lawrence Livermore, one of the, uh, the uh, weapons laboratories in uh, California. And instead of the, um, the fusion, the, uh, the plasma being contained in these gigantic magnetic fields, which is the traditional method being used at Princeton and elsewhere, you had um, a little pe- <coughs> excuse me, a little pellet of, I think it would be their deuterium or tritium or some kind of compound based on those, and you had gigantic lasers all pointing at these little, this little pellet, and they would all go off at the same time, and there would be this, this incredible uh, uh, energy and uh, heat and pressure brought, brought to bear on the pellet, and then uh, fusion would occur in it. It, would be, it was basically a, uh, a microscopic thermonuclear explosion. Mm-hmm. And this was, this was being studied at Livermore really for weapons purposes. They could have these little tiny explosions and learn something about the physics of uh, the big bombs. But there are people who said that this was a more viable method for harnessing fusion energy than the uh, magnetic confinement uh, method, but what you would have essentially, I asked somebody to spell out how a reactor would work, and uh, essentially you'd need to have a setup where you had um, you had these explosions occurring four or five times a second, and it would be each explosion would be the equivalent of something like um, I don't know a half a ton of TNT, which is uh, small by the standards of um, hydrogen bombs, but uh, still it's a hell of a lot of energy to contain. And so then the question is how you extract energy from uh, these explosions. And, uh, you know, so you had this enormous rush of neutrons coming out of these, uh, out of the, uh, the fusion. And uh, the, the method that they came up with, with at Livermore, again, this is the last time I checked, was to have a, have a gigantic waterfall of liquid lithium Surrounding, surrounding the reactor core that would absorb all the neutrons coming out from the explosion and somehow uh, turn that into heat. You'd have an, a cooling system built around. I mean, it was just the most wacky uh, technology and science run amok scheme that you can mm-hmm. possibly imagine. So, uh, and that was the most promising one at the time in the uh, mid to late 90s. So I am just... I, I just think that fusion doesn't... There are no reasonable people I know anymore. There are true believers, mm. of course, in the same way that there are true believers for for uh, cold fusion or totally wacky schemes. And, uh, you know, fusion... Uh, this Hot fusion isn't in the category of, of cold fusion, uh, but um, still, I give it absolutely no chance mm. of contributing in any meaningful way to... Uh, to uh, humanity's energy needs. Mm. You know, it's interesting, by the way, if you look at the, the economic incentive for fusion, obviously if we had controlled fusion, we, it would solve all the, the world's energy problems. We could, uh, it would solve the water problems. We'd have plenty of energy for, uh, to uh, desalinate ocean water, for example. It would solve uh, the global warming problem. Um, we, all our cars could be electric cars that ran on uh, electricity generated by fusion. Yeah, it would be a kind of utopia. Um, interestingly enough, there's there's no uh, n- no incentive for the private development of, of fusion technology. Or if you think of what happens, the the first uh, uh, consequence of that would be that the price of uh, petroleum resources would drop virtually to zero. So basically, all of the uh, all of the resources that make oil companies profitable, that make the that prop up uh, regimes in the Middle East, all of that would be Essentially valueless overnight, and of course. Yeah, but the Jim, the reason that nobody's investing in this is because the uh, the whole history of the research shows that it can't be done, or mm. that it's just in no way economically feasible. Yeah, no, that's what I'm I'm afraid of. But just on the on as you say on the on the principle that if if it were feasible, it would have happened by now. But this the the fusion reactor that's that's under construction in uh, it, it's a place called Caradosh. It's about uh, 20 or 30 kilometers inland from uh, Marseille in the south of France. Um, 
you know, the, the, as you say, the, the, the time horizon uh, they're talking about is 20, 30 years. Um, you get to a point, uh, the break-even point, where it's generating more uh, more power than it takes to confine the reaction, and then the ignition point, where it's self-sustaining. Uh, haven't got to either of those points. I think the Princeton uh, reactor, by the way, never uh, had a control. The, the longest controlled fusion process they were able to sustain last only also only a matter of seconds. Right. So, I, you know, I, the, the your and it took more energy really, to produce it than than they could extract from it. Yeah. That was the problem. They never yeah. reached the break-even point, as I recall. But the, the you know, you're arguing that it's it's not going to happen because it it hasn't happened, and there's some deep reason why it's not going to happen. You're probably right. And my argument is that it will happen because it has to happen. I can't see any other any other source of energy in the future other than harvesting energy from the sun. It's very hard to imagine, and 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 you know, and this the certainty that we're going to even if we slow the consumption of fossil fuels that we're eventually going to burn every bit of oil in the Earth's crust and every bit of coal we can extract and every bit of natural gas, and we're going to have lots and lots of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, I, I can't see any way over the you know, long term, over the next 100, 200 years, of reversing that without giant control mirrors fusion. In, Do you? Giant mirrors in space. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know. In a way, this is a prediction, not just about the technology, about the science itself, but about, it, it's kind of a social prediction. I believe, and actually I hope, that we are moving away from uh, gigantic, high-tech, high-maintenance uh, forms of energy production. Certainly fusion would fall into that category. I think fission obviously forms uh, falls into that category. I would much rather see lower-tech, um, uh, sort of, uh, widely distributed, uh, localized forms of uh, energy production. I think uh, solar energy is, is, is probably the most promising uh, possibility right now. I mean, obviously, you need tremendous um, technical advances in solar energy to make it uh, viable uh, globally, but, uh, and certainly to replace fossil fuels. But I'd much rather spend the money on on that, then on but the only uh, scheme you know you, you've uh, alluded to for making solar energy, you know, for generating solar energy of the magnitude that it would take to uh, satisfy the world's uh, energy needs, would involve something like uh, giant mirrors in space. So that's that's big science and big technology too. It seems to me. I think that the um, I think the possibility of uh, photovoltaic cells and uh, you know I think I I believe I hope that there will be. Enormous breakthroughs in that um, in that realm, uh, and and it's possible that some wacky fusion scheme, something akin to um, cold fusion, or some you know, there's sauna luminescence. There are all these sort of different fringe forms of uh, fusion that have been reported and haven't really panned out. It's possible, and that this is fusion that occurs not at these. Uh, you know, doesn't require this tremendous temperature, tremendous pressures uh, that you need for um, the old-fashioned magnetic confinement mm. and inertial confinement. It's uh. possible that some of those things can happen, and if they can, they allow reactors to be built on a much smaller scale and reactors that would be distributed instead of uh, these gigantic centralized machines. Then, um, then that would be a good thing. Hey, John, your your small is beautiful philosophy. That's so '60s. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's coming it, back. It's sweet. I Everything can see you holding, comes a, back. holding a daisy. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Jim, I, I, I'm completely Jim, listen, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're, a, uh, you're an idea nut, as am I, and you should know that all ideas have a natural life cycle. They all come into existence. They get old. They die. And then they come back to mm. life again. Indeed they do. Um, and and small so, so is is coming back. Do you, do you, uh, do you see any other... Uh, Technological fixes for global warming. I know that you know Freeman Dyson wrote an essay, an interesting essay, a few uh, decades ago, probably uh, when global warming was just beginning to swim into our consciousness. And he said that you know basically you've got a finite amount of carbon in the uh, uh, in the biosphere, and it's either going to be in the atmosphere or it's going to be in in the ground or in the form of trees. And if you want to, the only way of sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere is by re reforestation, by growing forests where 
forests don't exist. And, and, uh, and the, the process of photosynthesis takes the CO2 out of the air and stores it in trees in the form of wood. And that, you know, that's the, the, the kind of the, the green solution to global warming. At some point, we have to reverse the... It's not enough just to slow the production of greenhouse gases. The, whole, the process is going to have to be re reversed someday. And do you know of any other, uh, in your sort of canvassing of the scientific technological world, any other you know, proposed techniques for doing that? I, you know, I, I guess I'm an optimist, um, in part because I have been talking to optimists uh, lately. So, for example, I just read a, um, a book called uh, Breakthrough. I have this, uh, you know, at Stevens where I teach, I created something called the Green Book Award, uh, to draw attention to books that discuss environmental issues in a way that I think is really uh, compelling. And um, I just, within the last few weeks, gave it to a book called Breakthrough by a couple of environmental consultants who are saying that um, uh, the sort of soundbite is that the key to solving our environmental problems isn't limitation, it's innovation, by which they mean that um, we, uh, we need instead of seeing sort of industry industry and technological development as part of the problem, they're obviously part of the, uh, we need them uh, as uh, the as a source of solutions for these problems. I think that the solution will be, um, you know, will come in all sorts of uh, forms. Just uh, creating more energy efficient cars, I think there's a tremendous uh, potential for innovation there. I just read an article about, uh, now where did I see this? I guess it was on television, an article about um, these Japanese men who form a kind of uh, cult in which they tinker with um, hybrids to get uh, more mileage out of them. And these guys are now getting 150, 200 miles per gallon out of uh, customized um, Priuses. And, uh, you know, these are the sorts of things that car manufacturers could do as well. So yeah, I don't think they're, there's they're, going they're to be... Plug, they're plugging the, uh, the, the, these, uh, the, you know, the plug-in hybrids overnight into sockets that, are, that get power from plants that are burning coal. That's the problem. Yeah, I know. I know. It's not perfect. But I, I just... Yeah. I think yeah, they were there fusion is, plants. Uh. <laughs> right. I think that there is... I don't know. I've become this kind of free market... Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm sounding like Newt Gingrich or someone, but... Um, but uh, I do, I, I, I'm just confident, maybe because I work at an engineering school, I see all these bright kids, I think they're going to go out there, and uh, especially because the financial incentives are so huge, they're going to co go out there and come up with clever, not fixes, but uh, at least partial fixes that together can help us solve these problems. John, in my, in my anyway. experience, the, the sort of optimism you're displaying now is often a prelude to clinical insanity. <laughs> so you should have your wife keep a close eye That's on That's okay. You. That's okay. I'd rather be happy and, and insane than uh, sane and unhappy any day. Hey, Jim, all right, we've only, we don't have much time left. Um, how about a, a, uh, a quick foray into um, mathematics? First of all, uh, since you, you actually are a kind of quasi-mathematician yourself, can you give us your view on the uh, age-old question of whether mathematical truths are invented or discovered? Um, I wish they were discovered, but I'm afraid they're invented. I think that ah. mathematics, we now think of mathematics as the most sort of universal part of human culture. We, if we want to discover uh, or make contact with uh, other civilizations in the, uh, in the universe, we, we send uh, mathematical signals, we send a list of prime numbers, for example, because we think every civilization, you know, their science, their biology is going to look different from our, their economics is going to look different, their literature is going to be different, but they're all going to discover, you know, the same basic truths of mathematics. And I don't, I don't think that's true anymore. I think that mathematics is more is a sort of a, a more of a local thing, like an accounting scheme, and that it, it is a big pile of tautologies. And as you point out, a lot of mathematics does work very well. You know, there's the famous expression, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in science. Uh, you know, nothing is done more for uh, scientific knowledge and, and the control of nature than, than differential equations. But, you know, this is a very small part of mathematics, and most of what uh, mathematicians uh, do 
uh, most pure mathematics is, is completely useless. And in fact, mathematicians often revel in the uselessness of what they, they do, and they, that, that means to them that it's more of an, an art uh, than it is a science. You know, there's the famous Oscar Wilde quotation, all art is completely useless. And uh, the, the mathematician G.H. Hardy said, you know, well, I do number theory. It's, 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 it's pure, it's completely useless, and the, the kind of mathematics that does have a use I consider rather ugly. Um, I think it's, that is a very parochial view. Um, the, the, the great unsolved problem right now, the greatest unsolved problem in mathematics is, of course, the riemann zeta conjecture, which is about, mm-hmm. 100 and, about 170 years old now. It was um, first posed by uh, Bernard Riemann, uh, let's see, around 1850, 1854. It's about 150 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is something that, 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 that three or four books have been published on the riemann zeta conjecture just in the past few years. It's a, it's a really deep powerful conjecture that would unify uh, analysis with number theory and it would explain the weird pattern of prime numbers and um, I, I don't know do, I, do we have time to go into this a little bit uh, are well, you I, a, yeah. well maybe you can tell me if you can discuss it in the context of um, whether, what the future of mathematics holds what interests me is the possibility and I wrote an article in Scientific American called The Death of Proof that sort of touched on this in the um, early 90s. The question of whether uh, mathematics is now becoming so complex with so many different specialties and uh, subspecialties that it's it's really outrunning the cognitive capacity of uh, not only ordinary humans, but even the freaks who excel in mathematics nowadays. So I wonder now, if that's something that you've contemplated. Well, that's I mean, that's been true for... It's been at least 100 years since it was possible for a single mathematician to hold all of mathematics in his or her head. I mean, the last two great universal mathematicians were David Hilbert and uh, Henri Poincaré. Uh, you know, the early, person, early 20s. I, I interviewed a guy named Andre, you know, Andre Vey. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, Simone Vey's num- uh, brother, in fact. Yeah, the great number theorist. Yeah. I, um, I actually got into a kind of a pissing match with Edward Witten at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study of the Super. You got into a pissing match with, with Ed Witten? Yeah, well, That's long story. But, but anyway, he, um, he was annoyed with me, and he uh, insisted that uh, he thought I had a too postmodern an outlook. And so he insisted that I um, interview uh, some people who really dealt with truth with a capital T, uh, mathematicians. And the person at the top of his list was uh, his colleague at the Institute for Advanced Study, Andre Vey. And Vey was described to me as the last of the universal mathematicians. So he was somebody who in the 30s um, uh, co-created uh, Bourbaki, who was this uh, fictional character who wrote these papers that tried to uh, unify all of mathematics and lay the the foundations for uh, mathematics in a more rigorous way. And uh, so I went and talked to uh, Vey in 1994, and um, he said that he thought mathematics was becoming uh, too complex. He, um, you know, he modestly demurred on whether he was the last of the universal mathematicians, but he thought that uh, it certainly wasn't possible anymore to uh, claim understanding of all all mathematics. He said the problem wasn't that um, there was inferior quality mathematics being produced nowadays, but that there was such an astonishing amount of very high quality but very difficult mathematics being being, uh, produced. And a lot of the the goal of a lot of that mathematics is simplification and unification. There's a a program uh, that's... I, it's so difficult. I, I don't have any understanding of it at all, really. It's called the, the Langlands program. I think the the mathematician who envisaged it was Thomas Langlands. I believe he was at Princeton. And it's the, the idea is to unify branches of mathematics that look rather conceptually distant from each other. And so the proof of the um, of the uh, Fermat's theorem by uh, Andrew Wiles uh, put another piece in place in this grand unification plan. What Andre uh, uh, Andrew Wiles proof of Fermat's last theorem uh, essentially turned on the, the discovery that 
uh, that uh, modular forms were were uh, the same thing as were sort of elliptical functions in disguise. You know, two things that looked very different, that seemed to come from completely different area of, areas of mathematics, were at the deepest level the same thing. And this is what enabled uh, uh, Andrew Wiles to prove uh, Fermat's last theorem. Uh, and so it, mathematics is, you know, the progress of mathematics, it becomes more complex, but it also is striving for greater conceptual organization. But that's so some of these thing. advances that might be very complex and difficult to understand for other mathematicians in the beginning, uh, further work will simplify them so that more people, more mathematicians anyway, Definitely. can uh, understand them and use them. Well, I mean, for one thing, you get simpler and simpler proofs. You prove Fermat's last theorem, and the proof is, you know, a thousand pages long. And then people find shortcuts, and then people find ways of making it more elementary, meaning you don't have to use as much advanced mathematics. And pretty soon, it'll be taught, you know, to undergraduates. And, yeah. it's, you know, it's like music. When, when you know, Beethoven wrote his late quartets, they were so difficult, you know, very few uh, uh, string quartets could, could play them. And now any, you know, sort of student quartet at the Juilliard School can play them. And, and a lot of mathematics, you know, when I was a grad student, mathematics that was taught in graduate school is now taught to undergraduates. I don't know whether everyone's getting smarter or whether textbooks are getting better or what. So um, uh, I, I guess I'm a little more sanguine in the short term about, about mathematics. But in the long term, I'm wondering whether all of this unification isn't going to result in the, it's not all going to boil down to that tautology that Bertrand Russell cited, a four-legged animal is an animal. You know, if algebra turns out to be the same thing as geometry and elliptical forms turn out to be the same thing as modular forms, maybe it's our, you know, the, the finiteness of our, our, our cognitive faculties that makes us see something really, really complicated in something that's really just a big logical tautology that that you know a, a godlike being or uh, uh, you know a, a, a being in an, a, another sort of life form with with, with you know with ten times our cognitive capacity would see immediately. Uh, wow. So there we go. That's a <laughs> that that's a I think that's a an appropriately uh, uh, pompous. profound note pompous. to pompous uh, is the to, word pompous no, no. Uh, yeah profound no, on your good. side pompous on my well, I it's like funny being because it's 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 sort of profound and and uh, grandiose and and completely deflating at the same time that's why I like it yeah um, it took me five so, long hits to get to that conclusion actually <laughs> yeah. so anyway Jim I think you know I realize we're at uh, an hour and seven minutes so that's pushing the boundaries of uh, these chats um, I, I am glad we got fusion in there because, as I said, that grounded this uh, extremely metaphysical conversation at least a tiny bit. Won't be enough for those hardcore science junkies out there and blogging heads land, but uh, you know it helps. Um, but anyway, uh, I enjoyed it. I, you've got to come back on and um, and uh, talk with uh, you know we'll find some more philosophers or maybe even a mathematician for you to speak to uh, on uh, Science Saturday. That would be excellent. I, I love insulting uh, the mathematicians. That's one of my favorite. Uh, the book I just reviewed in the New York Times uh, by John Allen Paulos uh, was a, a, a called "Irreligion: A Mathematician um, uh, Sort of Deconstructs Arguments for the Existence of God." And uh, I like the idea of that. But I thought, you know, this this is a mathematician who who uh, pretends to a sort of universal expertise and has never read theology. And actually, it's not that bad a book. I mean, how dare he blunder into this territory? And when, in fact, most of his fellow math mathematicians are Platonists, and they believe in this mathematical heaven that's every bit as ridiculous as what uh, evangelicals believe in. Anyway, well, I, maybe, I'm sorry, uh, I'm still talking, and you wanted to go. Uh, well, have you insulted him so much that he wouldn't appear with you on Blogging Heads TV, do you think? No, he actually has an excellent sense of humor, and he's a very tolerant and humane man, so he may appear, and... Uh, uh, and I, I will uh, issue um, groveling apologies to him if he does. <laughs> you should work on that. Anyway, Jim, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. And uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure. I, I hope to see you on Blogging Heads again sometime soon. Uh, me too. Bye. All right. Take it easy.